Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. Wave guides, yay! Um, people freak out at wave guides for some reason. I'm, I think I understand why. Uh, it seems to be very complicated when it really isn't. Up until now, when we've dealt with waves, we've used a simple set of equations that seem to solve everything. You know, sometimes kappa is imaginary, sometimes you know sigma or whatever is imaginary. But in wave guides, uh, the simple approach doesn't necessarily work. Uh, there's a lot of bookkeeping involved and a lot of, um, well, not, not magic. I mean, you've done calculus and you've done algebra already, so it's just a matter of putting the two together in a good way. So, uh, <coughs> assume we have some shape. Do, 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 do. That happens to look almost exactly like the book. So, sue me. So, it's, it's a conductor, and this is just a cross section. So, this thing goes on for infinity. Um, this is the x direction, it's down the tube, and you have y. And then Z, let's see, X, Y, yeah, so Y goes up. Okay, that's correct. And then this is a conductor. It's made of a conductor. Um, and let's assume it's a perfect conductor, just to make the math easy. Um, otherwise, it would be too hard. And so um, that means the electric field inside the conductor is zero. Um, and if the electric field is zero, then the magnetic field must be zero as well. And so applying our boundary conditions, we determine that, first of all, um, at the, in, just inside the surface, our parallel electric field has to be zero. That's because inside the conductor, the parallel electric field is zero. And also we get to, um, uh, we know that the perpendicular B field just inside the surface is uh, zero as well. And this is just inside. So just boop, just move a little bit inside, there it is. So uh, we're interested in how electromagnetic monochromatic plane waves would move down the tube and once again we can do that monochromatic bit because uh, we just add the other frequencies in and everything works out. So we will get solutions that will have the form that look like this. So we have E vector complex which has uh, dependence on all four coordinates and that's going to be equal to some E naught constant vector that depends on the Y and Z um, times E to the minus minus plus I kappa X minus omega T. And then our B field will mu look much the same. Some B naught vector complex that depends on Y and Z e to the i kappa x minus omega t. Okay, so these are constants in terms of x and t, but they do vary according to y and z. So at different points along this cross section, you're going to get a different um, a different uh, constant to multiply the field when as you look through time or as you go down the x direction of the two. Um, they must, these equations satisfy Maxwell's equations. We don't have a charge inside, we don't have a current inside. Um, so we apply the basic set of Maxwell's equation, which I don't feel like rewriting for interest of time. Um, he, in this book, he, he sits down and says, by the way, these uh, E naughts have an X component, a Y component, a Z component, which, you know, shouldn't be surprising to anyone. These are vectors in three dimensions. And when you plug these all together and you solve problem 8.31, which I shall not do for you in this video, you get a set of six equations that look like this, which um, are rather complicated, but you know, just take your time and, and look at them bit by bit. And there's a certain pattern here as well, but don't, don't get uh, confused by that. So the derivative of the Z component of the electric field with respect to Y, minus the derivative of the y component with respect to z will give you i omega times the b the x component of the b field and we have other equations that are very similar so d of e x by d z minus d of e z by x nope i did that wrong do 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 excuse me i kappa e z is equal to i omega by the y component and we have d 
uh, I K E Y minus D E X by D uh, D Y that's equal to I omega B Z. So this is your three components of the B field, and we have a similar uh, relationship as you might expect, thanks to the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. DBZ by DY minus DBY by DZ is equal to minus I omega over C squared of the X component of the E field. And then similarly, DBX by D, DBX by DZ minus I kappa BZ is equal to minus I omega C squared, you guessed it, of the Y component of the E field. And then, uh, I did it again. I kappa b y minus d b x by d z by d y equals minus i omega c squared e z those are the six equations that you you get from uh, plugging in your e fields into maxwell's equations um, if you go and try to solve these we're going to talk about some special cases of the solution in just a second here you'll get these four equations that was solved for the y and z components of the b, the b and the e fields. So the four equations are the y component of the e field is equal to i over omega over c squared quantity squared quantity squared minus kappa squared I should have drawn that longer times kappa um, dex by dy plus omega dbx by D, Z. So it depends on the X of the fields um, with relate, uh, respect to Y and Z. So the Z component of this field is the same constant there times kappa D, E, X by D, Z minus omega D, B, X by D, Y. And the uh, B fields y is the same thing times kappa d bx by y plus minus omega over c squared d ex by dz and then the z component is the same thing times kappa d bx by dz plus omega over c squared d e x by d y and um, how you go from there to there is left as an exercise to the reader um, it is very straightforward calculus uh, geometry whatever you want to call it so um, anyway suffice it to say when you put the equation in this format you notice a curious pattern here the y and z components are determined only by the x components. Like I just said earlier, these are all the x components. So if we can just find out what the x components of the b and the e fields are, then we can quickly calculate everything else. Um, so when we plug this into Maxwell's equations, we have, we can get, um, these uncoupled equations looks like this so we have the quantity oh, actually it's like an operator d squared by dy plus d squared by d z squared plus omega over c squared minus kappa squared times e x has to equal zero and the same thing for beta everything has to equal zero um, now of course we have trivial solutions we can say well EX is zero or BX is zero and that'll that'll satisfy everything um, so if EX is zero then we have what are called transverse electric okay so what that means is the wave that travels down this field has E fields that only point in the YZ plane. They do not point in the X plane. Okay, so 
the wave is basically doing this kind of motion. You know, it's not, it's not, um, point, it's, it's, it's not pointing outside of that plane. So maybe it'll, it'll like, whatever. If the BX is zero, then we have transverse magnetic, same kind of thing. Um, if we have both equal zero, then we have something called transverse electromagnetic. Um, TEM waves are uh, transverse electro, electromagnetic, whatever. Um, if we have TEM waves um, inside of a waveguide that doesn't have anything on the middle, there's no charge, there's no current inside, then we end up with basically nothing. And the reason why that is is that when you plug in um, when when you plug in okay so Maxwell's equations say that the E field has to have zero divergence and the B field has to have zero divergence because there's no charge on the inside and no magnetic monopoles either um, so we can rewrite the E field or the B field in terms of some kind of potential, um, especially da, 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 da. anyway, long and the short of it is that if you have a TEM wave, there's nothing happening on the inside. There's no wave at all. It's just absolute silence. So you can't have TEM waves, which means basically the wave has to bounce up and down along the along the sides or in and out or whatever it does to make the thing work. So that's all there is really to say about uh, uh, waveguides in the beginning. Uh, next we're going to look at a rectangular waveguide, which is a rather easy one. I'm sure that uh, your professor for the course is going to have you analyze some other kind of waveguide. After that we'll do coaxial waveguides, and then after that we call chapter 8 done. So two more videos and you're done. Thanks for your time. Oh, before I end, um, this math is, is hard enough that if you find yourself having difficulty with it, I strongly recommend you go back and review very early material, um, especially surrounding um, you know, divergences and curls and stuff like that, and uh, hopefully it won't. Um, one of the reasons why it's difficult is because as you get to this point, that stuff that you learned is so far in the past that, that you tend to... Uh, you tend to forget how it all works and how easy it really is. So anyway, thanks for your time. Take care. Bye.